today I'm going to be talking about transposition of the great arteries. So this is following on uh, from our first podcast, which was on uh, Tratology of Fallot. And today I'm going to be talking about the most common of all the cyanotic congenital heart diseases in the newborn, and the second overall after Tratology. And it encompasses 5-7% to of all congenital heart disease and is more common in males than in females. And it's an important one to talk about because while it's all while it's common it's also very well treated in the modern age so that while untreated it has a mortality of 90 percent in the first year treated it has a survival of 90 percent up to that first year however it's a difficult one to talk about because it's quite complex as a lot of congenital heart disease is and uh, there are various different forms however the thing to remember is is that there a aorta arises from the morphologic right ventricle and the pulmonary artery arises from the morphologic left ventricle in transposition and the reason I use the word morphologic is because the side of the ventricle, the anatomic right and left, can be quite variable and deciding which is the right ventricle chamber, which is the left ventricle chamber, can be quite difficult and is one of the more important things to uh, to look at. So what are the, the different uh, classification systems? There's a clinical or functional classification system and uh, this is the one that's more generally used when looking at uh, at TGA with echo. However, what I'm going to be talking about is more of an anatomic classification system which, while there are multiple different subtypes, really looks at uh, transposition in two different forms, levo and dextro or DTGA. So DTGA is the most common and comes in about 60% of all transposition, while LTGA or congenitally corrected transposition of the great arteries is less common. It can uh, it can be seen in adults who are uncorrected because as the name uh, describes it is the congenitally corrected where there is also uh, atrioventricular discordance as well as there being uh, ventriculo great vessel discordance. So what do you do with all this uh, this raft of information and these difficult classification systems? And what I do is I tend to uh, to break it down into easy dif- easy ways of looking at each individual scan. So when I ha- see someone that has TGA, I have a, a bit of a checklist, and my checklist is composed of five components, and these are them. So the first thing I do is I want to look at the position of the aorta versus the pulmonary artery, because this is what's going to allow the definition of transposition to be reached. Then, which chamber is the ORV, what are the other abnormalities, what sort of surgery has there been, and then finally, what complications have occurred and what we can pick up on the different scans. And speaking of what are the different scans, the vast majority of these studies are MRI. Uh, While plain film radiography is of benefit with the classic egg on a string appearance, really it's it's less commonly seen now because these patients are operated young and uh, and the surgery is quite successful. So moving on to what do these MRIs look at and uh, this is a Cine TruFISP axial image through a patient with uh, DTGA and uh, if you're eagle-eyed you're able to pick up that the aorta arises from the morphologic right ventricle, the pulmonary artery from the morphologic left ventricle but if I slow it down a little bit here you can see on this still image the classic feature of DTGA which is where the aorta is anterior to the pulmonary artery and to the right hand side. So this is the important feature always to pick up, that if the aorta is anterior to the pulmonary artery, which it shouldn't be uh, in your conventional heart, there's something wrong. It's most likely transposition. If it's transposition, what side is the aorta versus the pulmonary artery? And that gives you your first hint as to what you're dealing with, as opposed to this case. And this case is a CT, obviously, of a patient who has LTGA, which is congenitally corrected TGA, and in this patient who's also had a Rastelli shunt, so that anteriorly we've got the calcified Rastelli, more posteriorly we've got the aorta lying anterior to the pulmonary trunk, but it's also anterior and to the left, so in this case this is LTGA. So the first step is always to look at the aorta and decide where does it lie versus the pulmonary trunk. And here we can see on this uh, sagittal true fist image uh, that As we come from posterior to anterior, we've got the left ventricle, we've got the right ventricle. Arising from the the right ventricle and coursing behind the sternum, we have the aorta. And immediately behind that, then, we have the pulmonary trunk. So this is a case of transposition, 
It also shows some of the other features that are important. Aside from a pulmonary uh, stenotic jet, which uh, is one of the complications that you want to pick up, this uh, view also allows us to move on to the second step of our checklist, which is determining which is the morphologic right and left ventricles. So yes, in a lot of cases you can decide based on the position of the ventricles, in other words, the anatomic right and left-hand side of the body, but you also have to remember that malrotation is malrotation as opposed to the cardiac axis is quite common uh, in these patients and that it's important to always make sure that you're dealing with the morphologic right, the morphologic left ventricle. So in this case the morphologic right ventricle is the more anterior of these and one of the features that we can see here on this scan allows us to determine that which is the excessive trabeculation typically seen in the right ventricle as opposed to the smooth walled left ventricle. Here on this axial view we see another feature that we're able to pick up which is the thickened moderator band which we can see extending from the interventricular septum to the right ventricular free wall here in this patient with right ventricular hypertrophy again another complication of transposition of the great arteries. We're also able to pick up here on this view the coronary arteries and position of the coronary arteries, distribution of the coronary arteries with regard to, uh, to the ventricles themselves is an important uh, sign to pick up on. Here we're able to see the right coronary artery and the epicardial fat. So if you have a ventricle with one coronary artery along its epicardium, this is most likely to be the right ventricle, two coronary arteries, the left ventricle. Here on this image then uh, we begin to look at what are the other uh, associated complications, the third step out of our five. Uh, if this image is a little noisy, it's because this is a case of an uncorrected transposition. It's rare for, you pe for these patients to be imaged because these patients are normally corrected at a very early stage. However, we're lucky here at UCLA to have Dr. Paul Finn, who's one of the pioneers of MRI and cardiac MRI, and who's now been doing a lot of work into imaging of very young patients. This patient was only three days old when owned went to this cardiac MRI. And here we're able to see that uh, there is a large ASD between the uh, atrial chambers and also if you're sharp you can see a very small uh, muscular VSD high up in the interventricular septum. So if those are the features then what happens next? The surgery in these patients is complicated. All these patients typically are put on prostaglandins uh, early on in life to keep the pa to maintain a patent ductus arteriosus and venous uh, and arterial mixing. Uh, and then there are various different procedures that are done. A Rashkin procedure is, is where a balloon septostomy is made through the, uh, through the atri atrial uh, septum. And then there are uh, different operations with names that are sometimes easy, sometimes difficult to remember, like mustard, senning, gelatine, and they can be quite complex. However, a few standard rules and by no means is this going to be uh, a definitive talk on the, the complex surgery for congenital heart disease but since its introduction in 1982 the arterial switch procedure or the jetin procedure has become the standard for almost all cases of transposition by no means all because there are uh, reasons why you would still do some of the older procedures such as a mustard or a senning in these cases if the patient wasn't suitable for the arterial switch, if they had intramural coronaries or if there was a late presentation. By late presentation I mean that if the patient was more than four weeks old because typically the arterial switch doesn't work well in patients who have uh, left ventricles that have been exposed to the low pulmonary venous pressures for a long time. Furthermore, there is a type of procedure called a Rastelli. Again, this is less commonly used than the Jatine. And uh, this is where you get a conduit formed between typically the right ventricle and the pulmonary, uh, pulmonary trunk or pulmonary arteries. And this is to bypass a left ventricular outflow tr uh, tract stenosis or atresia. So these, con these surgeries are qui quite complex and I'm not going to discuss them in, in any depth. I'm just going to show you a few pictures of what you can expect. This is a diagram of what a uh, baffle is. The mustard and senning really look quite similar on imaging. Uh, the baffle which directs flow in the atrium between the two chambers uh, of the right and left ventricle can be made either of pericardium such as in the mustard or of, uh, of the intraatrial septum in the senning procedure. And what that looks like on MR is that you get a, uh, a redistributed flow in the atrium and here we can see the area of, uh, of refashioned atrium with the two 
pathways for blood to go down into the ventricles themselves. Uh, on the uh, coronal view here, we're able to see that uh, there's mixing at the level of the atrium. However, this mixing tends to be in a laminar fashion so that you don't get uh, veno venous and arterial mixing to the same extent as you would obviously in an open atrium. This uh, is an image that we saw in a still image earlier on, and this is a picture of a Rastelli shunt a CT scan, and uh, it demonstrates another complication, uh, that here we're able to see the Rastelli shunt, which is quite calcified and a little bit stenotic in its inferior portion, uh, passing between the right ventricle and the pulmonary, uh, pulmonary trunk. And as I've alluded to in previous talks, there are novel therapies such as uh, percutaneous stent valve insertion into these uh, Rastelli shunts, which are becoming more and more widespread. So it's an important uh, area to keep in mind if you are going to image these uh, to make sure that you're able to, to get high quality, whether it be CT or MR imaging. So really that was just a very quick fly through of what uh, transposition is, uh, what the main classification forms are, what I do when I'm looking at a, at a case of transposition and then also very quickly just to run through what the main surgeries are. As I said, it's a complex area, uh, but one that, uh, that hopefully is made a little bit easier by this talk. So really there's not a lot else to, to say except say uh, thank you for listening and say thank you to, uh, to Sasha Malik who uh, is one of our up and coming stars here in the Department of Radiology and will hopefully be joining us full time soon. So uh, thanks a lot and we'll talk to you again.